Welcome back, listeners. Marnetta Larimer here, your host for Impacting the Classroom, bringing you another podcast episode that talks about big topics in education. So let's get to it. What's impacting the classroom? We're talking about social-emotional learning. It seems like a big buzzword in education right now. We're going to talk about what it really means, its impact, and some of the critiques with some of the leading experts on this subject. So, of course, we cannot talk about interactions without having our amazing guest, Dr. Bridget Henry, co-author of The Class Tool and CEO here at Teachstone. Bridget is the leading expert in student-teacher relationships and classroom processes that promote positive academic and social development in young children. She has authored more than 65 peer-reviewed manuscripts on these topics in the past 15 years. Welcome, Bridget. Oh, Marnetta, it is wonderful to be here. And, you know, one of the best things I've done in my career is get to know you. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I love you so much. I'm so glad we finally got you on here. <laughs> we have to do more of this. And in addition to having Dr. Bridget Hamry, we're having a double whammy here. Like we have Erin Gruel, educator, author, speaker, and activist who has dedicated her career to promoting SEL among students from marginalized backgrounds, listeners. You might know her work from the Freedom Riders, a group of 150 students from Long Beach, California, who overcame poverty, violence, racism, trauma, and low expectations through writing and sharing their stories. And more recently, Erin designed Waldorf University's Master of Education in Social Emotional Learning. Welcome, Erin. Oh, it's such an honor to be with both of you today. Okay, so I, I know we have a, a really big topic, but I cannot move forward until I say, first of all, that movie was amazing. Like your story with Freedom Riders was amazing. My question that is completely off topic, listeners, I apologize, Hillary Swank, right? So Hillary Swank played you. <laughs> How was that? And was she your ideal person to like be you for that movie? That's such a surreal topic for me. I mean, I'm an, I'm an ordinary teacher and I like to say I had extraordinary students. So when, when the opportunity presented itself for, for our story that had just become a book to be adapted into a film came up, I just assumed there didn't need a teacher. I just assumed that, you know, my students are so dynamic and so amazing that they would, they would portray this story of, of their lives without the need for a teacher. So I, I, I'll never forget, I was in this cafe with the uh, eventual screenwriter who also directed the, the film. And he asked this question, like, who do you want to play you? And it was just such a weird question. And I, I blurted out Hilary Swank. And he said, Hilary Swank, why? And at the time she had just won an Academy Award for the film, Boys Don't Cry. And it was such, an amazing film where she did it on scale and it was about a really tough subject about mm -hmm. transgender youth. And I just love that it was gritty and she has this incredible backstory as someone who grew up in poverty herself and, and at one point lived in a trailer that I thought if they're going to have to have someone play me, why not have someone that has a little bit of grit and a little bit of gumption? And I never thought blurting out Hilary Swank would, would actually come to fruition but I think she did a spectacular job. And I'm, I'm so glad that, that the writer honored my request. And I'm so glad that we were able to see that through. And I love the rendition uh, that she did. It was hard for my brother. He used to have a crush on her. And then when, when she played his sister, he thought that's kind of creepy. Uh, <laughs> she was so spot on and she, she you know, had all of my mannerisms and they raided my closet and, and did everything that you know was to be my doppelganger, but she did a phenomenal job. She's phenomenal in everything. And Boys Don't Cry, that that movie, if you haven't seen it, you must see um, True Story about Tina Brandon, Brandon Tina. So yeah, wonderful story, She an amazing pick. So listeners, I would love for you to reach out and tell us like it, your life story, who would your person be? Like, who's that famous person that would- Marnetta, who's <laughs> yours? Marnetta, who's yours? Man, I don't know. I, I, I wanna say I'm such a unique individual. There is nobody out there. <laughs> who's going <laughs> to do me justice, but I have to think on it. So I think I'll, I'll have to follow up on that too. Yeah. Bridget, do you well, already someone, someone mentioned like uh, Angela Davis Ooh. Or, or even Angela Bassett. She did, Ooh. she was robbed of the Academy Award for Tina Turner. So this could be her second biopic and, and you could gold. I don't have her, her body is not my body, but that, that's a, 
she looks way too good to play me like physically <laughs> have you seen her just. all right look i can do you this all day. All right. so yeah so just do you want to just email oh you're so sweet <laughs> so just email us linkedin whatever and just tell us who would be your person that to play like you in your life story bridget do you know who yours is before i move on no, but I am soliciting feedback from our listeners. So you tell me uh, who it should be, although that would be a really boring movie. So, all right. For those of you who know Bridget, who would her person be? So at podcast at teachstone.com, send us oh, no. your ideas of who would play Bridget, who would play Marnetta, and then who would be your person to tell your story. Like, wonderful. So, yeah, she did a really great job. And I think the nuances of the work <laughs> that you did were captured in that film too. Like I didn't live in a way, like I could feel it, right? It felt very just raw and real. And so when we're talking about social emotional learning, like this is why you're here, right? So let's jump in, right? So before we get into the critiques and the challenges of social emotional learning, let's talk about what SEL is. So Erin, can you define for us what it is and what it isn't? You know, initially, I, I, I didn't know there was a term for it. I began teaching after we had a, a horrible racial reckoning in, in Southern California after the Rodney King riots. So what I intuitively understood was that I needed to bring a lot of empathy and compassion to my classroom for the lives that my students were living outside of Room 203. In my community specifically, we had a lot of of gang violence. We had 126 homicides in a single year. A lot of that was perpetuated on, on the youth. So my students knew what it felt like to bury a friend or a father or a nephew or a niece. Unbelievable economic insecurity, uh, untested learning disabilities. And so there were so many issues. I also had a lot of undocumented students and, and, and also a lot of refugee students. So it was this beautiful tapestry of, of diversity, but within that diversity, they didn't like each other. You know, they, there was stereotypes and stigmas and, and rivalries and, and, and gangs demarcating their side of the street. So I, at the time, I just thought, I have to know who these students are, I have to understand their stories. I have to find culturally sensitive and relevant academia to present to them. And I have to teach with them, not at them. So a lot of the things that I did in initially, as, as I still do as an educator, I, I didn't know it had this amazing name, social emotional learning. So much of what we did do was emotionally based. And I think we, we cry a lot in my classroom. And those tears are cathartic and they often purge. But that was hard for my students initially because when you're this big guy who puts on a front or builds a wall or pushes people away, it's really difficult to, to have those feelings in front of people when you think it's going to make you feel less than. And so we had to be okay with not being okay. We had to have conversations about mental health that we didn't even know once again that that was something that we could talk about because there were so many stigmas about mental health in, in their community, especially for my young men. So I love that all the things that we did then that were, were trial and error are, are things that we are, are finally talking about in education and doing so courageously. Wow. You know, one of the things, Erin, as, as I was listening to you, we often talk about how, you know, you can't change what you can't see. And sometimes providing a label, providing a name to something can be very helpful because I think it helps educators, maybe unlike you, for whom that isn't intuitive to sort of see those elements of humanity, right? We're all people first before we are students, before we are teachers. And that's what I heard from you is at its core is that connection to the fact that we are all humans and, and we can't pretend that that exists separately. At the same time, I think there's this inherent tension because the second that we name social emotional learning as if it is something different than or separate from other kinds of learning, I think that creates a lot of sort of false dichotomies where, and, and I'd be curious about your thoughts about this. In my mind, social emotional learning is happening every single moment in every single classroom with every single student. And our failure to sort of acknowledge that and to think that there's it's something that happens during like social emotional learning time 
I think is is one of the challenges. So I'm I'm interested a little bit in how you came to that intuitive understanding or just how you think about social emotional learning as separate from or integrated into the daily work of teaching. It, it was definitely integrated in. It was it was definitely for me, it, you know, when, when your syllabus comes back at you in the form of a paper airplane and, and a comment, why do we have to read books written by dead white guys in tights? You know, that's very profound, profound and provocative. And I, I went to a university where we were one of the most celebrated writing programs in the country. So as I approached the literary canon as an undergrad, or when I approached learning how to be a teacher in graduate school, sadly, what what they didn't teach me was the relationship element, making things relevant. And so what I had to do immediately is I had to learn to pivot. I had to be flexible. I have to throw up things that in a vacuum or in a bubble that I created that I thought was going to work and, and realize it didn't work. And, and part of that was the why. Why are we doing this? And so I had to reframe everything about as an English teacher, why do we read? Why do we write? Why do we communicate? And, and how will that serve you after this 55-minute period, after the bell, the test, the grade, the quarter of the semester. These are things you need for the rest of your life. And so it, it was really for me, almost like guerrilla tactics. How do I, how do I become the student? How do I learn and allow it to go from just being a, a teacher focused classroom to a student focused classroom where they became the teachers as well. So I, I did not have the luxury of taking classes in college about social emotional learning. I, I we've never discussed mental health when I was in the halls of academia. So I think what I had to do was understand that there's a disconnect sometimes between the theory and the actual practice. And and I had to be very practical in that practice. Wow, thank you so much. So many things that you've said resonate with me, right? How you, you know, with them was the one thing that I wrote down, the with them instead of at them, right? Or to them, like that's a big deal, right? That's where some of that disconnect happens, right? As an adult, you know, you t tell me to do something, <laughs> like I might be like, oh, hold on, like there's a way you can do that if you want me something from me, right? So how does that not translate to all the spaces in which we're interacting with other people, right? Other, like Bridget said, humans, right? And I also love the fact that because oftentimes because, you know, we have a lot more of it now in academia, right, with teachers getting certified, but there's still so many missing pieces to help them to really understand how to support classrooms, you know, in this way, right? It's still very rigid and teacher focused and like curriculum driven, right? Instead of thinking about, you know, what's happening in this classroom? Who are these students? How do I make this content relevant? to them, right? So that they have these wonderful, concrete experiences that they, you know, can hold on to and learn and grow from. You know, and I think that it's amazing that you said that because I think sadly there's often these unfunded mandates in education. And I'll never forget when one of my students who was, was really struggling, and her name is Maria, in the feature film they named her Ava. But Maria made a comment, teach to me, and not to a test. Mm -hmm. And I think that there was a moment in time, sadly, that we were so data-driven and so test-driven that, that educators thought, well, we have to teach to the test. And we, we weren't teaching to the totality and the whole child. And, and sadly, when I began this journey, there really was this unspoken narrative of a school-to-prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. And that is disproportionately sometimes in our, our urban communities. And that is something that I had made a decision very early on. I'm not sending a single kid away. I'm not sending a single kid to a principal to be suspended or expelled. Because I had every single student who had come to me because they had been sent away from a school or a district. And I thought that doesn't that doesn't solve the problem. So So how do we in this classroom shut the door and, and learn from, from some of this trial and error, but we're not gonna send kids away. 
We're not going to stigmatize those that have been sent away. Eventually, I'm going to learn, and I did, why Maria had an ankle monitor, why Carlos had been kicked out of every school he ever attended, why Sherrod had brought a gun and threatened his previous English teacher. Those things came out after they felt safe. But I, I felt that I had been set up in the, the toxicity of the, the teacher's lounge when they were like throwing my kids under the bus. Like when right. they realized as a new teacher without tenure, these are the kids you're getting. And ooh, <laughs> they, you know, they knew my role sheet. And they, I think they wanted me to catch them, you know, catch Carlos tagging, catch Sherrod in a fit of anger, you know, catch Maria flipping me off and, and all of those things. And then we could just send them away um, and it won't be so problematic. And there was something about, there's got to be a reason that Maria's got that ankle monitor. There's got to be a reason that Sherrod brought that gun. There's got to be a reason that Carlos is writing his name on and on every surface with a Sharpie or a spray can. I got to figure out those reasons. One of the things, Erin, I love in listening to you is I see the ways in which fear at the individual and at the systems level gets in the way of what, to your point, most teachers come into the classroom wanting to do. And I think it's fear of a few things. One, it's fear of emotion. So one of my favorite crazy stories from our use around class, an observational tool that measures three broad domains, the first of those is emotional support, is early on in, in its adoption in one of the states, they told us that we needed to change the name from emotional support to social support because, wait for this, the Department of Education was not allowed to use the word emotion in any of their materials. Right? They said the Department of Social Services owned emotion at the state level. Right? Like, but I think that is an example that then just pervades our sort of fear of our thinking that we just don't want to bring emotions into the classroom as if that is possible. So I think there's fear of emotion. I also see fear of student autonomy. This idea that, so my favorite story there is uh, our faculty were helping develop the secondary version of class and we have this dimension that is about support for student autonomy. And, you know, to your point, Erin, going with the flow of their ideas, really letting them lead, truly sort of giving over. And the faculty at the secondary level thought, like, we, we score class one to seven. They're like, isn't like a four the highest? Because this idea that like, if we give students too much power, too much autonomy, we're going to lose control. So there's that fear of autonomy, that worry about about control that I think exists. And then the third fear that I, I hear you talking about that you clearly sort of pushed aside is that fear of truly being vulnerable and getting to know the other. And I'm just so curious about what it was in your sort of, I don't know how old you were, but young self that allowed you to sort of counteract some of those fears that I think so many of our teachers, it's less that they bring them with them, but they're sort of acculturated to, it, but, you know, in institutes of higher ed and in the um, sort of teacher lounge to become fearful about those elements. And it's so funny, you know, I I do really well in, in fear, which is strange because even, even to this day, I have so many fears and, and that identifying it has actually been really positive for me um, and, and being vulnerable in my fears because I, I think that the stakes are so high. So even as a teacher now, I'm still afraid. I want the lesson plan to stick. I, I, I want there to be a connection. I, you know, I want it to matter. And, and so I think there's, there's oftentimes we don't as individuals feel comfortable exposing our emotions, exposing our vulnerabilities, talking about fear, talking about the other. Um, and so I, I think for me, we, we, the collective, we being my, my freedom writer students is when we rip the bandaid off and we realize that we're all afraid of something that we've all had some trauma and there's some kind of trigger attached to that. And we all put up a wall and, and have that front and that facade. But when we are vulnerable and we put our dukes down and we don't swing first and swing fast, there can be that aha. And I think there was always that kind of collective aha. You could still have the fear. You, you could still have the trauma. 
but at least the healing begins. And I, and I think that was really important is, is it's all about healing. And I think that a classroom for me is, is such a civil right. A, a classroom to me is a place where we can equalize unfair playing fields because they are unfair. And I think when we, when we call attention to it and, and we give it voice and, and we address it. And I think that in my class, when we started addressing inequality, then we could also dream about a day where there could be equality and equity and, and, and being very cognizant that it doesn't exist yet. But how do we dare to dream? You know, how do we make the world that we wish to see kind of thing? And I think it was very myopic when we started. It was just room 203. But then I realized they never wanted to leave room 203. They were getting there early. They were leaving late. And and now virtually, we when we, when we gather, we call it Zoom 203. Like 203 became like a vibe. 203 became a place of the world that we wish to, you know, to create. It's a place where they could be seen, right? Like no one wants anything more than to be in spaces where they're like, real self is seen. Absolutely. One of my follow-up questions was how daunting, like it must have been to go to work every day and have to, you know, not only figure this out and like really support these children, right? These students at a, at a level that was new to them, right? And new to you, right? Because you're all doing this journey together. But to have coworkers who are just really looking for confirmation of the, them not being there, right? Needing to be there or like, and just the idea of turning away students, like, what does that tell them? Like, you know what I mean? Like, I just don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? What do I mean, they begin if they're turned away, right? You know, I think for me, there was, so, I had, I had a 45 minute drive. I, I did not live at the time in the city that I taught. I, I have since moved to Long Beach, but I, I didn't live in the city. Those were long drives. I would have imposter syndrome then and now. I would I would cry the entire drive home. I would, you know, sometimes you might nail it in period one and fail miserably in period two. So it's it's the, the constant having to reconfigure, you know, re renegotiate all of that. It's it's teaching is one of the toughest professions in the world. And if if you get it right one day, you might fail miserably the next day. And that that kind of roller coaster of emotions is very, very real. And is very, very real to this day. You know, circumstantially, it is really tough to be a teacher post-pandemic. It was excruciating during it, but I think we were all kind of shell-shocked. And now we're realizing the ramifications of the pandemic and and the havoc it reached and and and, and wrecked upon people's self esteem while they were in a box on a screen in their pajamas at home playing Fortnite rather than doing their English lesson. So I think there's a lot of studies that are going to come post pandemic, but it is it is hard, and it makes me sad that we are now in the throes of teacher shortages because teachers are like this is too hard. This is too much, you know. I, I I I need the win along with the loss, and I and I think that um, we're in a really interesting time in our country, where we can have conversations that we did not have before. But in in having those conversations, I, I want our students to be seen. But I think it's really important for our teachers to be seen and celebrated. And I think sadly that's not happening as much. And that's why I think we have a teacher shortage is teachers aren't talking about their mental health. Teachers aren't talking about their social emotional needs. And so I think that this podcast is, is giving a platform and a celebration to both. And I thank you for that. I think that's so important, Erin. I think, I mean, it's funny because at the top you said you didn't even think you were going to be in the movie. And I was going to call you out on that a little bit because we know that how important teachers are. To your point, the best teachers are able to create and cultivate a, a place where they can sort of then step back. But, you know, you were incredibly powerful in creating those conditions for success, but it's so isolating. And we hear that all the time. I was a teacher briefly. I felt that there is this sort of closed door mentality. Um, and I think our attention towards the mental health needs of educators, but also 
the importance of community for educators and giving time and space for that. Because I think what we hear all the time is that, you know, educators have a leadership who might be asking them to cultivate relationships, connect with students, you know, inspire their learning. And yet there's none of that kind of support for them. For them, it's just like, do this thing. And so I think really paying attention to the culture that we're creating to support our educators and frankly, compensation for the, the work without fixing those things, we're, the, the shortage is just going to get worse. Um, and I agree, there's a reckoning probably that really is beginning to happen because these these challenges are just so severe. You know, and I think that one of the biggest pinch me moments, you know, I had met the amazing uh, administration at this incredible university, Waldorf University, pre-pandemic. We were trying to figure out ways to like, to collaborate and work and, and myopically, you know, I'm, I'm a person that likes to touch and feel and be next to somebody. So, you know, at the time I thought, how do, how do we do that unless I get on a plane and I, I fly to your community? When the pandemic hit, all, all, bets were, all bets were off and out the window because suddenly the Freedom Riders who do touch and feel and see, we, we too were relegated to this strange space of being in boxes on screens. So we immediately went back to room 203 day one. Like people are gonna be hurting, they're gonna be scared. So what what can we do to maybe help people along this journey? What do we do to help kids to get them off Fortnite and actually lean in? But what do we do for teachers who need that that connection to get them away from a Super Mario or any kind of, of, of virtual game? So this incredible university said, well, what if, what if we do what you do best in person and can we, can we recreate it in, in a college simulated classroom? And we're like, oh, let's try. So Freedom Riders went back to school and Freedom Riders became guinea pigs in a way that we said, let's go back and let's look at those original stories, the stories that you wrote about in your journal, the story that became the basis of the Freedom Riders diary, the stories that were spotlighted in the film, and each of them have a theme. And maybe the theme is resilience, or maybe it's perseverance, or maybe it's hope. But let's not have the magic wand yet. Let's, you know, hope could also start with deep depression. And so, Tony, let's let's have you be the face of hope, but let's talk about your deep depression and, and your mantra of being alive at midnight. And you know, Narada, maybe you put the R in resilience, but your resilience came from you being homeless and everything that went along with that story. And Ty, you may be the face of empathy, but let's talk about the unbelievable abuse you face at the hands of your family and how you push through. And so what we started doing is using ourselves as, as storytellers and taking these social emotional themes and, and bringing them to life and trying to craft curriculum that that made sense to not only a kid who would watch and read, but an adult who would then be that teacher and, and say, now, now I understand why this kid is pushing me away and pushing this curriculum down. So it was a boohoo sob fest for us with light bulbs, you know, flashing and aha moments and saying, if, if we're getting it and we lived it, you know, could somebody in a class pick this up and really get it. And I just am so honored that that the Freedomers were willing once again to be my students. Um, some of them went back to school to finish their master's. Some of them were, were doing the last few uh, elements of their bachelor's degree. And we created this really cool program out of an urgency of now. People are hurting now. So how does education become relevant even more so now? And, and that's where we got to learn all the fancy terms that we were using that we didn't even know, as you asked earlier, Bridget, it wasn't separate, it was integrated. It was a, a part of, it was, you know, for us, it was our salvation. So Erin, thank you so much for that, for giving us like what social emotional learning looks like in a classroom, right through the storytelling, right in that classroom um, experience. Bridget, what does that look like from an interactions perspective? 
Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's sort of two things about that. First is that sometimes we talk about social emotional learning as if they are skills that sit inside a singular person. And to some extent, that's true, right? I have learned over time to be more emotionally relate, regulated in myself when my nine-year-olds are fighting. Sometimes, as I my 16-year-old taught me, I also just put on my headphones and don't listen to them, and that also works, right? So, But I have developed those skills, and I know what to do to support myself. At the same time, you know, all skills, actually even academic skills, are inherently relational, meaning I, in one context, may look way more competent in my emotional regulation skills than in other contexts, depending on the setting I'm in and the people that I'm with. So I think that inherently speaks to the fact that we can't develop social emotional skills in our children without acknowledging the role that the sort of moment to moment interactions play in them. I think the other the other piece is again this idea that and you I can hear it in, in talking to Aaron that they're separate from the academic learning. And so I think the other piece of interactions is too often we see teachers like, I am teaching my literacy lesson now. I will get to the social emotional later. And where you see those sort of remarkable, powerful moments is in moments of rigorous instruction where students are learning deep skills around writing or math or science that are made relevant to them and where teachers see the, the sort of social emotional learning. They see a child who is frustrated and about to lose it, and they make that move that helps engage and see them. They see a student who, frankly, needs to take a break and, and go out of the room. And I think it is that idea of these skills just being A, relational and, and happening all the time. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things that, you know, people like Aaron just get intuitively but I think in our work, we've really tried to develop ways that help sort of give educators space and time to be able to see that part of themselves. So, you know, one of the most powerful sort of developmental opportunities we have for teachers is something we call my teaching partner, but it's just a video based coaching uh, model. And it is helping a teacher watch 30 seconds of a video of themselves but helping them reframe and not necessarily think about like, how is that lesson going, but help them really see the opportunity for interacting in powerful ways. And, you know, one of my favorite stories, I was a coach in the very first round of MTP back a long time ago and was working with this incredible teacher. She's so incredible that she's actually still in our video library uh, because she's just so authentic and lovely, but she had a student who had bitten her and she was quite frankly traumatized by that incident and was having a really hard time interacting with him in the classroom, truly seeing him. And it was through us having a close enough relationship that I could then have her sit with her, watch a video of herself, watch her being distancing and frankly kind of mean to this student that she was, but at a distance, right? She's not in the moment. And it enabled us to have that conversation to help her see that and to help her really bring her best self in. And, you know, I think she started spending really intentional relational time with him on a daily basis and like immediately saw, like when he saw that she was invested in him and she had somebody in me who could help hear her worry, her concern about that, she was, she was able to bring her sort of authentic interactions in ways that kept him in the classroom. When this was in preschool, he was about to be expelled. And I think it is the power of those sort of relationships and interactions that are are just so critical to our students. Well, I was just going to say, Bridget, you also talked a little bit about banking time, right? And the importance of recognizing, yes. right? Lots of resources here at Teachstone to really support that work in the classroom. Go ahead, Miss Erin. Yeah, I mean, and, and I want to hear, I want to hear Erin's question, but or observation, but I think sometimes we think interventions have to be big and complicated. And what I love about the idea of banking time is we now have just have great evidence that simply spending five minutes a day, a few times a week, actually not teaching, just being with a student has powerful impacts, not only on their behavior, their attention, but actually on their stress, their cortisol levels decrease. Mm -hmm. I think it really speaks to, I always love that story because you're like, 
you as a teacher have the power to influence students spit, right? Like that's how they, that's how they collect cortisol. But that it really, I think speaks to the incredible impact that intentional interactions can have. But Erin, I want to hear what, what you were thinking. Well, I, well, I was just excited. I, I'm a student today. Like I, I always feel with my imposter syndrome that if I have the opportunity to talk about my story, it's, it's, it's really anecdotal and it's, you know, it's just in, in my little bubble, but I love being around experts like yourselves because you know what you're doing. You know, I'm, I'm still figuring out as I go along. So I love when I hear <laughs> words like intentionality and relationships, because that's what I was doing and not knowing if I was doing it right. So, you know, I'm sitting here and, and I'm learning. And that's, I think for teachers, we, we need that validation. You know, sometimes we, it's like, you're boiling the, the the pasta and you throw the spaghetti needles and hope it sticks. And, and, and sometimes it does. And sometimes it doesn't. And I think words like intentionality and relationships were part of my pasta plan. You know, I, I, it has, to, it has to matter. Yeah. It being the education, but also the, it as this relationship and, and why you're here. And, you know, it's, it's so vital and important. And, you know, I, I'm just an English teacher, but I know that a lot of teachers feel the same way about math or about whatever our subject matter may be. That's our it and that's our why. But I think it's really important, as you said, to to allow the kid while they're in your class, whatever else is going on in their head and outside, to know this is a safe space. Mm-hmm. And you're it's not punitive and you're not going to be punished for all that other stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes school can be very punitive and, and kids can feel very punished. So I love that, you, that you've created opportunities for teachers to learn and adapt in real time. Well, yeah. I also think, I mean, one of the things that is so important is, you know, I can watch any teacher for five minutes and find phenomenal examples of things they're doing well, even teachers who are really struggling, right? I mean, I think to your point, partly it's having a language and a lens for seeing some of the things that we're doing so that we can be most intentional about them. Because my observation is teachers actually tend to beat themselves up a lot and be the sort of harshest critics. And a lot of our focus is just helping teachers see the things they're already doing really well so that they can build on those and and do them with more intention. So I wish we had, uh, now I wish we had Lots of video back in the day. Uh, certainly, I had that thought watching the movies. I'm off, often watching movies, thinking about how we should be stealing snippets of great teaching from from those moments. You know, what's so funny? I love that we started talking about. The, you know, yes, there was a feature film, which is weird and wonderful. But we we had all these great films that we had taken with a camcorder in my classroom that we eventually made into a documentary, and it's hysterical because. It was back in the days with shoulder pads and, and, and my students ruthlessly mocked me. But it was fun to go back and, and see that treasure trove with that camcorder of the lessons and yeah. things that were good and things that weren't so great. And how, how do we learn from them? So I think a lot of teachers, as you said, we, we do beat ourselves up. And having a camcorder in my class was terrifying because I wasn't holding it. You know, a student was. But it was also what a great memento of, of a moment, a moment in time. Earlier, you were talking about some of the challenges post-COVID, right? And some of the causes of the teacher shortage, you know, Bridget alluded to some things that we needed to do, right? Like better pay, of course, right? Um, And just supporting the um, teachers. So we're thinking about those challenges in post-COVID, right? I heard from many school leaders that they really want to support social emotional learning, and they just don't know how to do that right? And it's just challenging for many reasons. So training teachers on SEL, supportive strategies before they quit, right? That leads to those shortages. And in addition to that, the children, as you stated, Erin, are displaying more challenging behaviors. So what can school leaders do to support social emotional skills in children, despite all those challenges that we talked about earlier? I think you have to lead with love you know, teach with your heart to, to be, to be present. I think we have to model. So I think that for me, I I didn't have that modeling at my school site. I I was terrified of that toxicity in the teacher's lounge. My principal was, was short-sighted. And then 
I finally met my superintendent, Dr. Carl Cohen, who said yes. You know, I, I had learned to master the art of asking for forgiveness, not permission, because every time I asked for permission, they said no. And then I had the superintendent who never forgot his why. And he started saying yes. It was like almost like, be careful what you ask for, because when then we'd ask him to come with us and he'd show up. And then we're like, oh my God, now he's in the room. And you know, and that that imposter complex, like if we do something wrong, he's going to see it. And and yes, he did. Of course he did, you know, because we're going to make mistakes. But I love that he led and he was present. And in those magical moments, it was capturing lightning in a bottle and he was there. So I think for people in positions of power and authority, you have to lead that. You have to show what it means not only to see a kid, but to see a teacher. What it what it feels like to hear a kid and, and hear a teacher, to say that this curriculum matters and, and we all matter. And I think that starts hopefully at the top. And I think that we as teachers have to be vulnerable enough, acknowledging our fears and to ask for it. You know, I, I need help. I'm afraid. I don't know what I'm doing. I can't do this alone. I don't have the resources for this book that I think is what my kids need to read. And I think when you start asking, it's very scary because there is the fear of rejection. But when there is a yes, it is eureka. It is nirvana. It It, it is a game changer. So I think that Whoever is listening to this podcast, whether they're a student, a teacher, or someone in a position of power, hopefully the takeaway is that we we all we all can lead with love. We all have to have courageous conversations when it's scary. I I love all of that. And I think I'm gonna go out on a limb and my friends who have social emotional curricula will not appreciate me saying this, but I think the answer is not social emotional learning curricula, which doesn't mean those aren't effective. That, that doesn't mean there isn't a role for those, but it isn't the place where we need to start. I think this conversation, listening to Aaron, I think we have to start with the people, right? And we have to start both with the educators and also with the students and making sure that they feel that they're in places and spaces where, where it's okay to talk about love, to lead with love. But I would also, and Aaron, you've done great work here. I think if I had a second sort of magic wand, I do think curriculum is super important, right? It's what drives mm -hmm. the day. But I think what's really exciting is things like the, the, the Freedom Writers curricula, where the social emotional learning is embedded into the academic content. So I think when you have those two pieces together, teachers who are really well-trained, who are vulnerable, who are open, and then curriculum that are scaffolding them around not just the academic content, but how to make things relevant, how to connect to the emotional experience of students. I think those are the things that ultimately, um, probably along with school culture, are going to help to change change the world. One classroom at a time, Erin, yeah. right? That's all it's about. Or even one kid at a time. One yeah. kid at a time. <laughs> um, I, I, I agree. And, you know, I, think, and I, I, I love that. At a time, Erin. <laughs> we want to make sure that we get <laughs> where you get. Yeah, it went by that fast. What? So yeah, those are great ending words. And obviously there's so much to talk about on this subject. We heard so much conversation between the two of you around social emotional learning and how educators and leaders can support children and families. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. I'm hoping that by listening to you that they do lead with love, but also listen to Bridget, right? And kind of tie it together to be mindful of the culture that they're creating, right? <laughs> when we're thinking about the students and how to really prepare them for success outside of the time that we have with them. Listeners, you can find today's, oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I, so, yeah, Aaron, one more voice. Yeah. Hopefully, the student in me hopes that this has a part two. I feel like I have two wonderful <laughs> new girlfriends, <laughs> and I want the conversation to continue. So maybe at some some point in the future, I I'd love to do part two. Oh well, yeah, I had questions I did not ask, so I would love that. <laughs> well, I, I, I need, we need to we need to put that in the universe. I I want to come back and do part two. Yes, we'll let's do it. Yes. All right. You heard it, listeners. You heard it here first, right? You can find today's episode and transcript on our website, teachstone.com slash podcast. And as always, behind great leading and teaching are powerful interactions. Let's build that culture together. 